Hi everyone. Welcome to another session of Chetina School of Laws webinar series titled Arbitration as Area of Practice, Not Just Rosy Promises. I am Shanmu Sudram, currently pursuing my BA LLB honors at Chetina School of Law, and I will be the moderator for today's session. It's such a pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today, Mr. Ganesh Chandru. Thank you so much for being here with us, sir. To briefly introduce, sir, he is currently a partner of Dua Associates and he specializes in arbitration and commercial litigation. He is admitted to practice in India, England and Wales and Singapore and is a fellow of Charter Institutes of Arbitrators, UK and the Singapore Institute of Arbitrators. He also advises and represents parties in litigation matter before the court. Prior to relocating to India in 2015, Mr. Ghani spent more than 60 years in Singapore during which time he worked with some of the top international law firms and Singapore law firms. He also acts as an arbitrator and he is a member of panel of arbitrators of the Singapore International Arbitration Centre, the Indian Council of Arbitration and the Asian International Arbitration Centre. He was an elected member of Council of Singapore Institute of Arbitrators from 2010 to 2014 and chaired some of its key committees. During his law school days, Mr. Ganesh was an avid participant in Moot Court competition and he participated in India. He, sorry, he presented India and, at Philip C. Jessup in International Law Moot Court Competition in Washington, D.C. We are so honored and happy to have you here with us, sir. I missed your busy schedule. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, sir. Before we proceed with the session, I would like to briefly introduce Chetina Academy of Research and Education and Chetina School of Law. The Chetina group, with legacy over 16 year, 60 years of education, have been pioneers in providing a progressive learning environment across Tamil Nadu. They are currently responsible for over 12,000 students in 22 private and government aided schools and colleges for medicine, dentistry, engineering, law, physiotherapy, nursing, architecture, other health sciences, and pharmaceutical sciences. The Chetina School of Law is recognized by BCI and approved by UGC and provides an environment that provides high quality education through active learning methods and give experience with experienced faculty and exposure through legal internships. The School of Law is a member of IUCN, Academy of Research, uh, Environmental Law and International Association of Law Schools. Without any further ado, can we proceed, sir? Absolutely. Yeah. Sir, can you give us an overview of arbitration and can you let us know how it is different from other methods of dispute resolution? See, arbitration is, uh, is sometimes referred to as an alternate dispute resolution process. Essentially, to put it in a layman's term, I would say that it is uh, something like akin to a civil suit being adjudicated in a private setting. Arbitration is a process where the disputants agree to submit their disputes to individuals in whom they have trust, whose judgments they trust. And this individual, who is he or she is called an arbitrator, listens to the parties, considers their case, looks at the weight of evidence available before them, and finally come to a decision and give their judgment. A judgment in an arbitration is called an arbitral award. So this award is then taken to court for enforcement. So it's entirely a private process and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's completely confidential now by law in India. So that's what arbitration is all about. But the great part about arbitration, Shanmugam, is that it's uh, the major advantage of arbitration. It's there is an international convention called the Convention on Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. That's called the New York Convention. Uh, countries that are parties to this convention, there are more than 160 countries that, are, that have ratified this convention as of date. And therefore, an award made in country A, which is a party to this convention, can be enforced uh, like a judgment of a court of law in another country. So it's very easy for you to take this award and enforce it in, a, in another country uh, easily, rather than if you have a judgment against a foreign party, then it's not going to be that easy for you to go and enforce it 
in that third country unless the country where the judgment was made has a reciprocal enforcement arrangement with the country where it is sought to be enforced for example in india uh, judgments made by high courts in india can be enforced in about uh, seven to eight jurisdictions uh, across the world because of provisions in our civil procedure court and similarly in other commonwealth countries so but an award arbitral award made in india can be enforced across almost uh, 160 countries of course this is subject to uh, reservations made by parties when they have signed or ratified this convention. That's the single uh, most important advantage of arbitration as you, as I think, uh, you know, if anyone asks me why should parties go for arbitration rather than other processes. Uh, also, it's important to know the difference between international arbitration and domestic arbitration. You see, in India, for example, if there are parties, two Indian parties having a dispute, and they have an arbitration clause in their contract which says that if there is a dispute, then the uh, dispute will be resolved by way of arbitration. Then it is just completely domestic because both the parties are Indian, the transaction is in India, it's a domestic arbitration. But let us say there is one Indian party and let us say there's, a, there's another there's a foreign party, party from the US, for example, and they have a cross-border transaction. And then they have an arbitration clause and that's, for example, they, they choose London or Singapore or even India for that matter. Let's say, let's say they choose Chennai or Delhi as a place of arbitration. Then since there is a foreign element in it as an international party and an Indian party, then this is called an international arbitration. So there's domestic arbitration, there's international arbitration. And also arbitration can be ad hoc, like parties just agree to arbitrate without um, you know, oversight of any arbitral institution. It's called an ab uh, ad hoc arbitration. Most of the arbitrations in India at present are ad hoc. Institutional arbitration where you use an arbitral institution and you agree that these arbitration will be conducted in accordance with the rules of this arbitral center, then that becomes an institutional arbitration. Coming to your uh, point about the difference between arbitrations and other methods of dispute resolution, the second part of your question, I think the most important thing is you, I mean, the traditional way of dispute resolution, at least in the modern world, is litigation. Litigation is go, you go to court and you file a case. Arbitration, I've already told you what it is in a private setting, but it's a binding decision, okay? Uh, but if you look at other alternate methods, for example, you take mediation or conciliation. Right there, the mediator tries to help the parties come to a settlement of the dispute. So it's not a binding decision. After the mediation process, the parties come to something called a settlement agreement, and then they're bound by it on, based on the law of contract. So therefore, this helps parties resolve the dispute and the mediator plays a passive role in helping them agree to come to a kind of a decision. Then there's something called negotiation, which is in fact the first process which in my view, parties should actually try even before they go for arbitration. So both parties, the senior members of the, both the parties, the management can meet and try and negotiate and see if they can settle. So many of the dispute resolution clauses actually, in very big contracts are multi-tiered dispute resolution clause where they generally provide for negotiation and if it fails, they may provide for arbitration. Sometimes after negotiation, they'll also try for mediation and then if it fails, then you go for arbitration. So this is uh, the entire idea is to try and resolve the dispute in the best possible way for the client. And I guess these are all the various processes. And arbitration is of course now gaining very good popularity because of the way uh, business is being conducted. Thank you, sir. Could you please tell us how the arbitration practice has evolved in recent years in India? Okay, how the arbitration process has evolved in India in recent years? Um, you see, India traditionally used to, even now, for, for a lot of our legal procedures, we follow the English common law. Right? English common law is very similar, not just to India, but to countries like, for example, of course, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, Singapore, and our neighbors, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and, and even the US follows the English common law. So we have traditionally adopted the English Arbitration Act. For example, in India, the modern arbitral legislation first was in 1899. 
and then we have the 1940 act both were based on the english then english arbitration legislation but then india after it, op it opened up its economy in a very big way <clears throat> in the 1990s in 1996 india adopted the arbitral model law <clears throat> on international commercial arbitration do you know what arbitral is arbitral is the united nations commission on international trade law yes. which is a specialized organ of the united nations right and they have various model laws one such model law is for international commercial arbitration india adopted the arbitral model law and we enacted the arbitration conciliation act 1996 but you see the way this, that is a fantastic piece of legislation in my view but the way it was interpreted by the courts uh, in some of the cases that were decided the way parties also kind of used its provisions kind of necessitated a uh, big a uh, human cry in the international legal community because there were certain foreign awards which were kind of the court said that it could be set aside in india so these kind of decisions created a lot of uh, human cry but then it's not just india i think many countries uh, have evolved over the time so it's like the arbitral legislation has now evolved and then there was a recommendation by the law commission of india for amendments to be made to the arbitral process and to the arbitral legislation so in 2015 a lot of major amendments was brought to the indian arbitration act and there were further amendments which have been brought last year in 2019 one very very important um, amendment that has actually changed the arbitration practice as such in india is the speed in which now the arbitration process uh, will go through <clears throat> there's a new section 29a in the arbitration conciliation act in accordance with which an arbitral award has to be made by the arbitrator within 12 months after the pleadings have been submitted by the party earlier it was from the time the arbitral tribunal was appointed but in 2019 it was amended so 12 months from the time the pleadings are completed an award has to be made by the arbitrator parties can agree for a 6 month extension beyond that either party can go to court and ask for an extension and the court if it finds that the reasons are justified typically grants an extension if if the reasons are justified this however exempts international arbitration seated in india earlier it was applicable both to domestic and international but in 2019 this particular amendment is now applicable only to arbitrations that are domestic it doesn't apply to international arbitration that takes place in india and it does say that even in those cases <clears throat> the tribunal has to attempt to complete it within 12 months this i think is a fantastic amendment and it has completely changed the way arbitration is practiced in india for example earlier arbitrations were done in a very lethargic fashion people used to just lawyers used to do it on sundays or you know evenings and it took on uh, it took forever for an award to be made but now things in fact when this was introduced in 2015 uh, many people felt that this is not going to work but as a practitioner i can tell you that this is probably one of the best things that has happened in indian arbitration speed with which the arbitration process is being conducted is really uh, so that is one of the main advantages the other very big advantage india now has is perhaps in the whole world india is the only country which has adopted the international arbitration guidelines on conflict of interest in international arbitration and we have new schedules 5 and 7 that have been added to the arbitration act which uh, essentially helps uh, to have impartiality and independence of arbitrators so arbitrators need to declare before they take on appointment as arbitrators as to whether they have any relationship with the parties or they will be available for this case so there are a lot of these um things that have been introduced which is which is very good the other thing is the provisions relating to setting aside an award have been made very tight because one common application that parties generally make after an award the unsuccessful party would go to court file an application to set aside the award under section 34 and they would say this against the public policy of india one english judge in a very old case said this public policy is unruly horse who's going to tame it you know everyone uses public policy so it has been clearly defined and you can't just as a course go and say public policy if you look at section 34 there are various explanations 
and it's now it's going to be very difficult for a party to get an award set aside unless it's there's some flagrant violation of principles of natural justice and it's really the award did not take into consideration the party's submission so these are very very limited grounds on which you can set aside an award and one more very interesting uh, amendment that has been made in 2019 is that now confidentiality of arbitral proceedings is by law introduced in our arbitral legislation so that is uh, very very good you don't have the newspapers talking about your arbitration unless the parties waive confidentiality both parties says it's fine then it's it's okay but otherwise you need to follow the law no? by law your arbitrations are confidential but generally in investment arbitration it is not there's something called commercial arbitration which i'm talking about there's another area called investment arbitration investment arbitration generally are in the public domain so that's a different uh, animal altogether so in this uh, session i'm dealing only with international and domestic commercial arbitration so i guess these all put together has changed the way arbitration practice is looked at in india now it's not any more uh, uh, just a ancillary practice it has become a main area of practice and i think it's uh, it's an extremely important area of practice of law and it's becoming extremely popular and uh, with parties as well and i'll tell you in uh, due course why uh, this is become popular thank you sir the other question that i wish to ask you is you have had the experience of dispute resolution in india and other jurisdictions how would you compare the practice of arbitration in india with other prominent seats of arbitration see um i have of course as you rightly said i have uh, done arbitrations in india and then singapore and england and in other jurisdictions as well um the main difference i feel between uh, the way we practice arbitration in india the seats uh, here we give a lot of importance even now to a lot of oral advocacy so in india everybody wants to go and you know have this day in court so they want to have their day in arbitration they go they want to you know make submissions after submissions application so that is the traditional way in which uh, arbitration was perceived it was like exactly like litigation they would want to replicate it in a private setting but when i told you earlier yes it is akin to a civil suit in a private setting but there are lot of differences the civil procedure code does not apply to arbitration proceedings the evidence act does not apply to arbitration proceedings but that said there is a supreme court judgment which says that the basic principles enunciated in the cpc as well as the evidence act can be taken as a guide by the arbitrator but they are not bound by strict rules of evidence provided in the evidence act so it's definitely definitely you know uh, very different so we don't need to exactly replicate the court process and go on and on if you look at practices in certain other countries i think even places like singapore malaysia it's only evolved in the last 10 15 years earlier it was very similar to how it was in india so generally in an international arbitration setup a lot of emphasis is given on the written submissions so your oral advocacy is useful when you cross examine witnesses and when you do your preliminary applications yes <clears throat> but a lot of it is given on your written submissions even when you go for example let me give you an example after hearing is over after cross examination of witnesses is over typically in india you would fix 3 4 days for your oral submissions or legal submissions whereas if you have an arbitration outside india in one of those other seats i was talking about after the cross examination of witnesses there's about half a day given to parties for making closing submissions and then they would be given one month <clears throat> to put in very detailed written submissions based on what evidence was um, you know presented before the tribunal in india we do all that as well we also give written submissions but we still need the, that five days of oral arguments to finish that's the major difference between uh, <clears throat> arbitrations held in india and and outside i would i would think the other is of course um, the way arbitration practice is perceived <clears throat> for example in other countries i would say let's say in england or singapore this is uh, it's it's a completely uh, full fledged area of practice but in india i would think that 90% of the lawyers who say they do arbitration <clears throat> have an extremely busy court practice so they would keep arbitration as an evening or a weekend venture 
but that is all thing of the past right now we have law firms which have dedicated arbitration teams which focus completely on arbitration of course you do court litigation as well but it's just that when you have an arbitral uh, hearing for let's say for a week then you do not really take up other litigation matters in court so therefore it's very important for you to focus on the arbitration practice uh, in, a, in a full time manner so that you do justice and the clients are all benefited i think these are the main uh, differences thank you sir i guess this has given a good information about arbitration in india and the other question i would like to ask you is what are the challenges that young lawyers are like to likely to face in the practice of arbitration <clears throat> it's not just young lawyers i think practical legal practice itself for lawyers it can be it has its own advantages and challenges but when you come to young lawyers if they want to start arbitration practice one advice i would like to give is of course you could uh, you know do arbitration practice uh, in a kind of full uh, you know kind of um, full time uh, manner but it's important for you to have some experience of litigation as well so you should go to courts and have some basic understanding of how the litigation process works before you kind of um, start doing arbitration practice in a um, in a full fledged way um the challenge obviously is uh, unlike in court when you will have opportunity when the senior tells you to go make some representation <clears throat> in an arbitration typically when you have a final hearing a junior lawyer might not get that much of opportunity to present before the tribunal unlike in uh, litigation practice but that said as i told you a lot of arbitration practice is in writing so i think that is only a very very small uh, kind of a challenge because maybe in 5 years time it's very very uh, i'm i'm sure there'll be opportunities where the junior can do his own arbitrations or assist or do small applications or whatever and i think uh, if one is very patient and is one is going to be very dedicated and they put in hard work this is an excellent area of practice for any young lawyer and uh, the other problem which i perceive is that if you are doing a lot of international arbitration uh, then it could be possible that for example a case the governing law of contract may i'm i'm sure i mean the parties can be from india and let's say another country but the governing law could be some third country's law for example it could be uk law or german law if it is uk law or english law it's very easy for us because as indians law is very similar we all you know our laws are based on the english common law so there there are similarities of course it's not exactly the same but you would see similar judgments you know a lot of house of lords judgment for example has been followed by indian supreme court now of course now we have the uk supreme court as well and the court of appeal uh, but let's say if it's german follow the common law tradition so it could be those laws are based on the civil codes that those countries have so well let's say you're involved in a case which involves german law so definitely there could be challenges for a young lawyer but that should not be looked at as a challenge that's an advantage because you get to know other systems of law and uh, it's an excellent exposure to you not just to indian law but to laws or uh, substantive law of other countries and these days you have material available at your fingertip you can get uh, you know it's not like the good old days by god we to go to some library and get a book or you have to you just google or you you on internet there's so much resources available obviously of course you should not just depend on that you should go to original sources but i think that's another kind of area where it is a little different from other areas of practice if you're practicing international arbitration you need to only know your law but you will have an opportunity to know the substantive law of other countries as well which is a challenge but it's also not it's very exciting yeah thank you sir i would like to ask you another interesting question that why do you think that practice of arbitration is not just rosy promises yeah why is it not just rosy promises see what exactly do you mean by rosy promise right for example somebody says hey you come and do this wow it's excellent you going to do very well so those are promises but it looks very rosy right but in arbitration it is 
definitely rosy and it's not just a promise it's a reality i'll tell you why <clears throat> firstly it's very intellectually stimulating if you are going to be involved in it number one in a country like india where the litigation process can take a very long time arbitration is completed in a very very quick manner therefore once you start an arbitration you're going to be busy throughout so within 12 months an award needs to be made so the pleadings are going to be done quickly then you have the statements of uh, the witness statements which have to be prepared then you have oral hearing then you have written submissions so things are going to go in a very very fast manner and you as a as a young lawyer can see through the case you know from the start to the end within a year and a half at least but if it's going to be litigation a civil suit you're waiting for years right for so you may not even know when the trial is going to happen i mean i'm not trying to say that uh, it's it's a real fact there's a pocket explosion in this country you know courts are overburdened the whole idea of this arbitral process and other mediation and other things is for the for, to remove the burden from the court system so that commercial cases could be decided by private persons so this is a excellent thing for a for a junior lawyer or even a um, you know a lawyer with let's say a decade of experience to see the process through and get the matter resolved or uh, you know adjudicated within a year year and a half that's that's excellent and if you are going to be you know as i told you patient and if you are going to be dedicated this area of practice can number one be intellectually very stimulating and monetarily as well it can be very rewarding i can tell you that so it's not just rosy promise it's a real promise yes thank you sir finally in this current scenario that the world is in what would be the future of arbitration mm-hmm. practice okay i have uh, in this current scenario that we are all going through see if this current scenario was not there probably you would have invited me to your law school to give a to talk to your students right but here i am sitting and uh, having a webinar with you and uh, people around the world around the world can view it if they want to this is exactly what is the position now for arbitration as well you know very well that the supreme court and high courts in india are conducting uh, hearings virtually it's not easy because when you have a physical hearing in india in a court you have hundreds of people gathered in a court they come quickly and you know matters go on your admissions on a given day then you have final hearings but arbitration unlike court when you have an arbitration hearing if you go through the entire process of arbitration there are only a few times that you really physically meet with the tribunal typically you meet during a preliminary hearing where directions are given Now, unless there are interlocutory applications you really don't meet the tribunal till the hearing itself but if there are interlocutories then you have to go and meet you have to have a physical hearing uh, sometimes and then the final hearing is conducted but many a times in international arbitration when parties are located in different uh, countries preliminary hearing for directions interlocutories are all done virtually it's either done by audio conference or by video conference that's become a, even before all this uh, issue of covid it was very common to have teleconferences or video conferences for preliminary hearings as well as for interim applications or interlocutory applications it's only for the final hearing especially when you have to examine witnesses that you have to physically meet in my view apart from the cross examination of witnesses which even that can be done virtually apart from that everything else in my view can be done you know through video conference even legal submissions can be made to the tribunal via some video conferences examination of witnesses is a bit of a challenge because it's very tough for you to go and see who the witness is i mean the witness is sitting and you, you you can see me on the screen but you do not know what i'm doing am i playing with my whatsapp or is somebody sending me messages how are you going to control all that so therefore that bit is a bit of a challenge but even that i think many people have uh, kind of uh, overcome that and even cross examination is now being conducted on video uh, in fact it's easier in my view to have arbitrations done on video rather than litigation because in litigation court there are so many cases on any given day this you can plan well in advance you can do this uh, hearing by video but i'm not saying that this is the uh, this this is going to be the the only method i mean i'm sure at some point in time in due course we should be able to go and do physical hearing but till such time 
I think uh, technology is definitely going to be of help for parties. That is one thing which I guess is, uh, is, is definitely um, very important. Uh, that's a major change. This is a new normal and I think we all just need to get used to this uh, new normal. And in terms of which I already said, if uh, there are already tribunals saying that, you know, just record your submissions, maybe for about half an hour or one hour and send it to us and give us detailed written submissions. So it's probably India will now emulate what is being done elsewhere. Um, so for your legal arguments, it's best that you put in written submissions, detailed written submissions so that the tribunal has it, they can read it. And then you spend very little time on a video conference where you can uh, just point out the salient features and it's easier for the tribunal to follow when they have something very detailed in their hand in a written form before you make these submissions. So I think these are methods and uh, you know, kind of uh, processes that we need to adapt in this uh, changing world for the arbitration practice. And one other thing, this entire uh, the last few months we've all had, we've, many of us have spent time at home, working from home. See, life is a very interesting journey. Right? Normally you are now doing your LLB. You go through the course and then you have an examination at the end. But life is very different. It conducts the examination up front. And from the examination, we all learn lessons. The whole world is going through a major examination now. And what lessons we learn out of this, in addition to the commercial practice we are all doing of humanity, of being kind to others, respecting nature, giving nature its space. We are all encroaching on nature. These are all very, very important lessons that we are learning. And hopefully after this all uh, is better and the world recalibrates, I think we would have a better tomorrow. And take it from me, I've told it elsewhere and I'm telling it again now. India, for India, this is the golden age for Indian arbitration. We are at the horizon and India will contribute to international arbitration in a great way in this century. And youngsters like you are going to play a very, very important part in that. Thank you so much, sir. I'm sure everyone tuned in has learned a lot from this session. I personally have gained a lot of insights on this topic. Thank you so much, sir. That brings us to the end of this webinar session. Thanks to everyone who has tuned in. Do tune into our future webinar sessions. Please take a look at our website and other social media platforms like Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube for information about the upcoming sessions. Stay safe, stay healthy, and bye for now.